chapter four um kind of introduces the problem that HTML widgets is trying to solve. Um, oh, sorry, I should I should introduce the whole thing, really, shouldn't I? Um, right, okay, so this is the, um, um, if you're watching on YouTube, this is a recording of a book club run by the R for Data Science community. Um, we're working through a book called JavaScript for R by um, an author called John Cohn, who, um, uh, and it is, we're working through chapter four of the book, which is called Basics of Building Widgets. It's, this chapter is all about um, kind of a, a package called HTML widgets that is used to um, wrap around JavaScript libraries, the, the kinds of things that create you know, interactive visualizations or interactive uh, data tables and stuff that um, you can, as a user, you can interact with in the browser. Um, so we're building up towards um, understanding the kind of, th the, the difficulties of getting a JavaScript library like that, getting your data from R, into an HTML page such that uh, the JavaScript library can access the data it needs, access the, um, the, you know, like the kind of plot configuration type variables that it needs, access the um, HTML elements and stuff like that that it needs to modify in order that R can work seamlessly with these JavaScript libraries. Um, and it's a non-trivial problem, um, but there are commonalities in how the code uh, kind of looks for a variety of different JavaScript libraries. And um, so we'll kind of work through, work up to understanding that, I think. Right. Um, but most of this chapter, R is not mentioned in this chapter a great deal um, because what we're trying to get across is um, precisely what sort of skeleton code you need in an HTML document such that um, you can transfer data into the appropriate JavaScript library and, and have it interact and have the user interact with it and things. Um, okay, so we're going to learn how to you, you sort of how to use JavaScript visualization libraries from HTML pages. We're going to discuss the sort of the details that you'd need to know about if you wanted to um, um, use an, a, a JavaScript library you've never used before in an HTML page. And also, it, we, we, we need to know that because the same things are kind of important when you're trying to um, make that library available to a, a typical R user. And then there's a little summary towards the end of the chapter um, that, that, that kind of a little cartoon that explains how HTML widgets ensures that all these, the data, the dependencies, and the kind of um, contextual stuff in, in the HTML page are all wrapped up all together to, so that they work. That probably explains absolutely nothing. Um, so well, let's, let's get going. Um, right, um, okay, so, the the chapter starts with a section where um, the author's kind of explaining what kind of stuff you would need to um, be pretty fluent in if you'd found a new visualization library that you wanted to use as an R user, what kind of things you would need to know about how, in, in order to um, use that library from R. So 
the there's a little workflow at the very start of this chapter where he explains that you know the first thing you should do is to try and use the library as it was intended as a kind of uh from javascript and in an html document um then you might want to look at all the kind of dependencies the kind of modular structure of the package itself of the library itself to see whether um install you know whether there are complications to install in it whether you need to build and minify everything yourself whether there already is kind of um a uh, kind of minified version of the the package already available for you um and then also to see how other people use the same package um so for example i mean a lot of the example libraries that are used in this book plotly um high charts can do so many things that um i I, I think I'd struggle to ever write an API that wraps out I, any of them. Um, but the the author recommends, you know, if you find something, try and try and find lots of examples of how other people use it, use use that library, and in a in a kind of ideal world, the the syntax that is required in order to use that library should be quite consistent. And if the if you don't get that kind of consistency for the, the syntax to use a library, um, it might be quite difficult to wrap um, the, the library for the R user. But also if you are, if you do identify a, um, a library where the the syntax is quite difficult to follow. Perhaps it would be better just wrapping a sub component of that library. Certainly, um, I mean, I was having a look at cytoscape.js and d3.js and stuff, and these things are huge. Uh, but if all I needed to do was to represent, you know, a, a bunch of nodes connected by edges on a, a figure such that the user could hover over a a node. I would only need a small subsection of either of those libraries. Um, and again, um, study the study the the library itself. So, for example, um, look into the API documentation for 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 the library, so that you can um, get a clearer picture of of how that library is expected to be used in um, um, in the real world. Um, and then again, use it again. Um, so you've got to use it, use it, and then use it again. Um, because it will be very difficult for you to make something that was written for JavaScript to make it fluently accessible from R if you don't have a, a pretty solid understanding of how to use it as a, a JavaScript user. And that's, I don't know, I mean, that's probably a little bit ch challenging in a book that doesn't uh, aim to teach you JavaScript in any detail, but uh, I don't know how you feel about that. But this is, but this is basically how, um, I mean, it's a slight tweak, but this is basically how I learn any programming tool. So you start by learning the the kind of hello world example. You um, try and kind of uh, see more advanced examples that other people have written, see whether there's bits of code that you can reuse and things like that. And then eventually when you're confident enough with that, kind of use it in anger in your own projects and try and apply your own data sets or your own problems to the the thing that you're trying to learn so you're gradually building up your knowledge of how to use anything in the in the same kind of way um but yeah um you can't just 
use something, you have to also study it. Right, so that's um, the, the kind of workflow in the, the, the first part of the chapter. Then, having done that, there are a few example um, uh, JavaScript. They're all visualization libraries in this chapter. So it talks about Plotly. It talks about um, high charts. And it talks about chart.js which are um, all kind of interactive um, XY plotting libraries. Um, I added a little bit more information about HTML and the DOM and things like that into this because of, there wasn't much of an introduction to those concepts in the prerequisites chapter, um, although it did kind of brush past it as well. Um, so um, maybe this would be better if I open it in. Oh, no, I need to open the files now. Um, OK, so what we're aiming to do here is to work out what the content of an HTML page of an HTML document should be in order to use each of three visualization libraries and then when we've done that we're going to see if there's any kind of commonalities um, any obvious differences between how the three libraries are used and um, have a think whether you know having used them would it be reasonable to um, uh, extend what we've learned from these three libraries to um, an, another visualization library or another kind of data table representing library or something. Okay, so I've, I've rewritten the files that are in the book a few different ways to emphasize some of the similarities between the three examples that are used. Um, but this here, what I've got is a kind of um if i hold on i will fill it out into a, into a browser window i think so i'll be back with you in a second okay um right where are we more than 4.2 okay so this is a recap of HTML structure. This was taken from chapter two and then kind of modified slightly. A typical HTML document looks like this. You've got a, a kind of HTML tag at the top, then a head tag and a body element, sorry, a head element and a body element. Stuff that goes in the head is things like, you know, the title of the page, other kind of metadata like the character encoding, um, some of your dependency loading goes in here, things like CSS sheets and um, libraries and you know scripts might be imported here. Um, whereas the body element that typically that that handles the kind of displayed content of a page. So you might put things like, you know, um, uh, a, a, the header that is presented to the user in there. You can also add scripts into the body elements of a um, HTML document. And this example came from chapter two, so we've already studied it. But all it does is it, um, here we've got a JavaScript thing where we have a little counter, oh, sorry, content thing. Um, it, this variable here refers to the paragraph element here. And what happens is once the page is loaded, the text held by that element is modified to contain this string. 
So what's presented to the user is rather than trying JavaScript, what's presented to the user is the text has changed. Okay. Um, so from the JavaScript side, you can access HTML elements. You can modify content within those elements. Um, either this is automatically, but you could do it on click on hover and things like that. Right. Um, the examples in the book all have a, a bit of code that looks like this. So in the header, in the head element of the HTML document, they load a JavaScript library from kind of adjacent to the HTML document on a kind of local machine or equivalently in, in the browser, basically. Um, I've modified it so that I didn't have to download the libraries into the, um, you know, the, the repo for the course notes, for the book notes, sorry, I've been teaching. Um, uh, so all of the examples that I'm using are using, um, you know, high charts has come from a content delivery network. Okay, so the example for Plotly, and Plotly is a very um, full featured library. Um, I couldn't quite get the HTML to format properly. Um, but so the, 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 the kind of skeleton HTML to import the Plotly JavaScript library and then create a interactive line graph um, looks like this basically so you import the library in the head element then in the body element you set up a um, an element that contains the chart that you're going to produce then there's a little bit of JavaScript down here where that element that you've just set up is identified and you produce a plot that is attached to that element. Um, here we're just setting up a bit of data um, and whatever the uh, kind of whatever this plotting function requires as its kind of plotting options. So we've got the element that's going to hold the chart, we pull that chart, we pull that element out and uh, we, we sort of generate a reference to that element and then we add a plot to that element. And what the user can actually see is the user just sees the, um, the, the plot there. So I can actually run that um, if I just... I'll just push this to one side and get the file for that up. Um, plotly. So this is the content's exactly the same. Um, open that in the browser. And yeah, so so we've got a plot that looks like this. We can actually inspect that. And here we've got, um, oh. right, let's have a see what we've got here. ID equals chart. So if I bring that um, script back over, okay, um, we set up this element um, here with an ID of chart and is a corresponding element in the kind of rendered page. Inside that, almost everything that's produced in here has been added by the Plotly library. Um, all I've done is set up some data and then pass that data into the, uh, a Plotly function. Um, so yeah, so you're, oh God, I've lost the figures there. I mean, it's it's very 
it's, it's an impressive library, but I, I really just can't navigate plotly. I just find it so difficult. <laughs> Uh, you probably zoomed in too close, Russ. Uh, it, it's probably just focused in an area. Um, I just have a quick question for the team or for the group. Uh -huh. yeah. um, with the code example on the right, you notice that you create a variable raw data, you populate it with an XY coordinate system, and then you create a second variable with plot data that points at raw data. With the Plotly new plot and, and, and populating that in your uh, example one, uh, uh, variable or, or named object, you're populating it with plot data. Could you just replace that with raw data? Would that still operate the same way? Yeah, I, but I, I, I structured it like this to reveal some similarities with the, the next examples. Okay, um, good, good. All right. Um, because some of the libraries, the, um, the kind of configuration options for producing a plot are also wrapped up in that. Uh, are also sent to new plot and here there were no kind of configuration options so I didn't have to make something that so this would be equivalent to the data that you sent over from R you might additionally send over a JSON containing like the line should be green the label should look like this um, but I, I I chose to separate the data that's going to be presented from the kind of formatting options for that data, but uh, it doesn't make any difference in this script. Um, yeah, um, so that's Plotly, um, and and really that's really only scraping the surface of what you could do um, with Plotly, but it looks very similar to what you could do with high charts. So again, we've got the kind of boilerplate HTML header, the head element you load in a script um, from high charts, and then you make another div element. Again, we've given it the same ID, but that doesn't really matter here. Um, um, you create an HTML element that's going to contain your chart, and then you run a little script that, you know, there's a bit of data here. Um, there's some um, kind of, this is the data that we're going to pass into the high charts function. Um, this is the kind of data that we might pass over from our, we might modify that data such that it can be used by high charts. But it, the, the, the process is exactly the same. The element that we might attach the plot to, it's the same kind of thing. But um, what was the difference? The difference was here, rather than having the script create a reference to this div element, we pass in the name, the, the ID for that element to high charts and it's responsible for finding the appropriate elements in the page. Um, so that's a, a kind of subtle difference between the, the how you call high charts versus how you call plotly. But overall, there's a, very, a great similarity in the, the kind of structure that we need to, to just make a um, figure using the two. Um, and again, we can look at high charts and it's produced this part. I mean, it's not the same plot, but it, um, uh, but it's interesting and it, like again you can inspect everything and so we've got the the id for the chart is here um, and the content within it has just been populated by high charts so high charts has found the appropriate elements into which it's going to stuff all the code required to produce this interactive plot um and yeah so that's i mean that's pretty cool um where's that gone wrong um here there is a third example not to um really push it too far but it, again it looks exactly the same this is a third javascript library 
we're calling it in exactly the same way. We're importing the library from a CDN. We now we populate a canvas element rather than an, a div element. But it's another form of HTML element into which we're going to add a chart. Um, and then we run a little script where a reference to that element is made. We uh, and then down at the bottom, we call a function that adds to that element a, 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 a chart.js um, visualization. We're setting up the raw data again and then kind of so we're indicating that it's going to be a bar chart here when we're making the plot data and we're kind of passing in that raw data as well. So I'm kind of just trying to separate what what is a component of the plot versus what how you would describe the plot. Um, yeah, so so the structure looks exactly uh, the structure looks broadly the same. Um, and I thought, well, that's quite neat. I'll go away and see, you know, uh, kind of simple examples for like D3 or something like that and see whether I could elbow it into the same structure. Um, and every example that I found for D3 was so, so over the top that, um, and also I, I found it quite, I found it quite a difficult library to learn because everything, all the, a lot of the main tutorials for D3 are built on these observable notebook things. So there's very little, very, it's very hard to find examples online of a plain HTML document that wraps some D3 code. And I'm sure that's how I, because I, I took a little course on it like five years ago or something. And um, I'm sure that, I'm sure we were working directly in HTML when we did it. But, um, I, I, I didn't have time to finish that little um, vignette. Um, but yes, so um, so so these are three different libraries. We've tried to work out what structure the data is, that is what structure we need to set the data up into such that um, it can be passed into the library. What additional information we might need to set up, you know, whether it's a bar chart or a line graph or something, and how, how do we encode that? What elements need to exist in the HTML document in order to um, add a plot? Um, and what... Um, files we need to have available in order that the plotting library can work. It's all that kind of contextual stuff that HTML widgets is solving for you. So admittedly, you can make HTML documents in R using, you know, the um, What's it called? HTML tags or something like that um, package. So you could reasonably write a little script that, you know, you, you have some data in R, you um, convert it to JSON, add that JSON into a um, into a, a kind of script like this and then write that script into a script tag, add a little div element tag and then wrap it all up and save an HTML file based on that or, you know, I, I don't know how, how else you might do it. But there's a few different points in the the HTML file where you need to inject some code. Um, and um, the HTML widgets package helps you to, con 
to to construct the, the the kind of skeleton that you need and also like not every you know people are going to want to use your um package you know if if you wrap some javascript library say you know supercharts.js i don't know what right and people in will be developing in r want to use that but we'll want to use it in loads of different contexts. They'll want to use it in their Shiny app. They'll want to use it in a, from an R Markdown document. They might want to just make a plain HTML file that contains your wrap, you know, built from your wrappers. So you have to, you can't kind of hard, you can't presuppose how your library is going to be used in the future. So I think using a tool like html widgets does kind of future proof um this kind of stuff so you know i could write this kind of script for a different javascript library but i would end up having to rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it if i wanted to do it over and over again i think um anyway so we'll go into comparing and contrasting the different things so in those three examples there are a few points where they where the where they differed, and there were a few points, you know, there were there was a broad similarity, and there were points where they differed. So there was, you know, where is it placed? Is it a canvas element or a div element? How does the plotting library know where to put the plot? So um, you've got some function was called in that script where. Um, you either passed in a reference to the element or the element's ID and you know and and the 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 charting library found how to add its code into the appropriate site. But you have to know, you know, how it's gonna how you know how it finds where it's gonna put the plot on an HTML page. Um yeah da, 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 da. how is the plot configured so um so this is like if you're passing data over from r to a to be used in in one of these libraries you have to know um not just how to convert it to json you you have to know how to convert it to json that is the appropriate data structures for that charting library so um, it might be an array, it might be a, um, well, they call them objects in JavaScript, but they look like the kind of, you know, key value pairs that you get in, in other languages. Um, um, yes, and, and also you have to know, um, but yeah, I mean, without HTML widgets, would you know how to convert your data frame to uh I'm sorry no that's not html widgets responsibility without um json light would you be able to convert to a json thing um yeah and you know if you're trying to you to to make a, a a really complicated visualization library available how much of its how much of its abilities do you really want to expose to the R user? Because it might end up being a maintenance headache for you if you try and write a really complicated API when you only needed the bar chart functionality and you end up with a kind of 10 year burden of maintaining a <laughs> JavaScript, uh, like an R wrapper for a JavaScript library that you never really use anymore. Um, Yes. Um, so what's this final bit here? Um, so, yes, so this is just a kind of typical structure of, uh, of what those um, HTML documents looked like. But it's injecting this in, inject it, knowing what this should look like, and also kind of ensuring that your IDs are unique within each HTML document because you could add multiple charts using the same library they can't have the same id if you don't mind me extending rust to one comment in your example so just for the team 
notice in his highlighted area with the ID charts and then the second tag, uh, not tag, uh, uh, argument style, and then giving it a, a hard coded value. As an extension in web technology, the cascading style sheet, you could actually apply your, uh, uh, I guess it would be the class. You could, you could say class of such and such, and then add some H, uh, some CSS attributes, which would contain your width and your, and your height. And the, the important reason that uh, inline styling versus a CSS, the reason this is important, if you put that in a very large HTML document, you're going to have to maintain it at every entry or every line of that text. If you put it as a CSS, you only have to write it once so that going in and maintaining it, if you want to change your style or change the, the attributes for that uh, element ID uh, or class of, of element, you just need to modify those values and then magically the entire web page changes as well. It, it's just a more uh, inline is not overly recommended. No, I, it's okay I, yeah, for small sorry, things, I know. but for I large. Just copied and pasted. No, no, yeah. I, I just yeah, I, 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 no, I understand the thing. I like that. Yeah. But for, from an outside uh, observer who isn't overly fluent in the CSS world, a lot of that chat just sounds like I could modify a CSS block and have huge effects on or throughout a web page that I have no idea how to fix because it's Good just, point. if there's just one part of a website that I want to change, it's very hard not to change every other part of the website using CSS as far as I can tell. Um, but that comes from my current ignorance. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, no, I know, I, I appreciate the point. Um, but yeah, um, so what I was trying to point out was that there's a few, you know, if you want to add a chart to an, an existing HTML document, you need a way to inject the dependencies. You need to inject a, a unique element, an element with a unique ID that is appropriate for the library that you are using. You need to inject a script that can convert um, data that you are um, maybe acquiring from R um, into the um, plotting library. And then you need to call the appropriate function. And I mean, it's only like four little steps, but they're dotted in different places in the HTML document. And potentially, you know, if you've got multiple charts, if you've got multiple libraries, there's lots of places to step on each other's toes. So using a tool like HTML widgets will simplify um, that, that kind of uh, thing. Um, and then did I have another bit? Oh yeah, there's a lovely little figure in the um, thing. So the very final section of this chapter, there was a kind of little like, how would you, how would you, as an R developer, how would you write a package that calls some JavaScript library um, and injects its uh, visualization capabilities into an HTML document if HTML widgets didn't exist? And I was having to think about it, and I was thinking, I probably wouldn't bother, to be honest. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, so you need all these different steps that I've kind of probably talked about a few different times during the past hour. Um, so you need to create the relative, relevant document, import the external libraries, add whatever elements you need inside the body of that HTML document, and convert your R data to JSON, embed it in the HTML, or otherwise modify the DOM somehow. Um, and then, um, yeah, add the, the kind of JS script and then seamlessly work with the whole of the R kind of data communication stack, which is no simple task. And um, thankfully, we will be learning how to use HTML widgets next week, or at least for a, a very kind of, it's like a, a simple example, I think, in, in chapter five but it does reveal a, a little bit about the, um, the, the structure involved. Now, I, um, 
I have a, there's a, this is a project started by the author that wraps the chart.js library. So it provides an HTML widget functionality for chart.js. Uh, which is one of the examples in, in, in this chapter. If we have a look in the installed uh, directory, there are, so you, it includes a bundle of the chart.js kind of library. Um, there is a little um, JavaScript thing that's kind of built on a skeleton that HTML widgets provides a tool to build. Um, and, and that'll be discussed next week. Um, so each HTML widget um, based package has a, a kind of script that looks like this. So, you know, what happens on click, what happens on hover, and things like that are encoded in this script. Um, and some configuration stuff for the same thing. Um, in the R side, oh, I've probably picked too complicated a thing. Um, you need a way to kind of write a R facing API that allows you to, you know, pass in whatever your data frame or your map data structure or whatever else it is that you're working with in R across to that um, JavaScript library. Um, and to be honest, I think that might be the, um, hold on, there should be an HTML widgets here. So create widget thing here is the 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 function that is exposed on is the html widgets exposes to allow you to kind of wrap the javascript library um, but actually making that library's api accessible to our users is something that you'd have to think how best to do um, yeah um but i thought it was quite an interesting little uh, I thought it was an interesting chapter. It was quite, I mean, it was quite short and the, the examples were pretty repetitive, but probably for a good reason, really, because a lot of it, um, a lot of web development does seem pretty repetitive, to be honest. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so it was, you know, these are the the important elements that you need to have in place to make um, one of these libraries workable. So how are you going to do that as an R developer calling a, a package that lives in another language? Um, yeah, and we'll learn about that over the next couple of weeks. Um, I don't know, has anyone got any uh, further? Just to jump in, I guess, with a comment, Russ, um, uh, or, or rather to share something, I'll share yeah, it in yeah, chat. Cool. Um, I'd kind of been digging into the e-charts for R, um, I guess within the past few months. This is another one of John's libraries, which which wraps okay. the the e-charts e um, uh, library. What, what's kind of nice actually, and so I, I just uh, dropped the link that points to the to one, a reference for one of the functions is, I, I feel like he's find, found like this really interesting balance or way in which to wrap the API for a particular chart type, you know, so it's sort of like there are named named parameters for like a small subset of kind of options, of slate options, and then there's this big heading that says see also. Um, and that's really where all the magic happens. So you're just going to yeah. follow that and you go to the, the you know, the pages, uh, um, uh, like the, the fundamental documentation of the uh, of, of, of the JavaScript library uh, and, and, and there like you can see all the options and all that needs to be done, you know, with eCharts for R is you just write a list and that just happens to correspond to, to, to you know, the JSON form where you can, mm. uh, you know, just like a named, named list where, you know, like color of such and such Siri, it's really kind of nice because there he sort of hands, you know, 
the, the package just passes a set of parameters to JavaScript. And you know, he is a like a package author and maintainer doesn't need to really do any work except to make sure that 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 set of uh, that like those set of parameters are passed directly to JavaScript. You know, there aren't any you know deprecated parameters that need to change as soon as as soon as underlying JavaScript library changes. I'm not sure if anything of what I just said makes makes sense, yeah, but yeah. Uh, in, in digging into it, I I I found it really. Initially, I was a little irritated because, uh, you know, as, as a lazy R user, I wanted everything to be explained on the uh, you know, package down page. But uh, then I got to realizing it's it's quite an elegant and nice solution from the the maintainers yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, side. Cool. It's also kind of a fun library right, that I've yeah. quite enjoyed. So I was going to ask: we in the text that we covered three libraries that seem to do on uh, a basic level seem to do a, a lot of the same things just in different ways and then here's here's an additional one here of e charts <clears throat> i'm curious what might drive somebody to choose one package over another it seems like you your for your choice would be made for you when you get to extreme cases but short of that it would just be something that uh, that seems to click with you or something that somebody trained you on to help you make your choice is is that right or or what what are your thoughts on how to choose which library to incorporate i don't know arthur do you want to well i i think i i, I posed that question to john when he attended uh, during one of our sessions and it seemed like he you know it, it's like you know you need a particular thing for a particular project so you know then you could wrap a wrap an existing library or maybe it's just something from the library that particularly appeals to you. Um, yeah. uh, that, I mean, that's kind of my sense. I, I can yeah. drop another example too of uh, the, uh, actually a library that, uh, an R library that wraps uh, a JavaScript um, um, uh, uh, a library that's 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 dep like frozen, you know? And, you know, one could reasonably ask like, why, why on earth would you want to wrap that since, you know, it's a kind of potentially an end of life and it's just, uh, you know, the author in, in the repo kind of clearly says, well, I needed this for a project. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, drop, I'll drop that in the chat. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, yeah, I, um, I don't know. I, I, there is often a, a kind of worry with JavaScript projects that they will get to the end of their life considerably quicker than you actually wanted them to. Um, and I, th I think... I don't know. Personally, I probably would. I, I would urge on the side of kind of using established tools and dependencies that have been around for a while rather than kind of flashy new things. But like, um, yeah, so but the problem is that probably means that every tool that I would ever use has probably already been written a wrapper for in R, so maybe it renders the whole first half of this book useless for me but um yeah i, I don't know i mean um i, I don't know if um the the usually is because uh, in R with the the kind of static graphics that you you kind of used to from ggplot2 and base graphics and, and things there are a less places for kind of innovation than there are in interact interactive visualizations i think and um the i don't know i mean i i think it probably would a lot of people's choice of what they would like to use comes well from, you're well that's a cool thing i would like to use that your your fringe cases have already been solved or or the the extension of somebody applying that library has already been conveyed you can go you know uh, uh, see somebody else using that same library or, or application with the the newer innovative libraries d3 as an example there are it's a it's an open playing field to add your own contribution of of ideas into that uh application i, I guess to what my my comment back to ryan in choosing particular libraries, I would say, is it easy to comprehend, you know, and, and that's a, that's a, 
a choice level of, of the person, does it make sense? And if it does, then you'll, you, 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 you have a good bond with that library and can exercise it. If it's foreign, if it looks weird, if it's like, I don't even know what the heck's going on. And, and right now for me, D3 is very much like that, but you, you're, if it, if it appears foreign, then you may have a lack of tendency to uh, utilize it because again, you're gonna be spending most of your effort trying to figure out what the heck they're doing versus actually applying it and getting an output. I hope that helps. Cool. And I would, I would say that same comment with anything. If, 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 if tools, uh, let's just talk mechanics. If you don't mind for a moment, yeah. if you have to work on your car, um, do you want to go to a, a local store that has the tool that you need? Um, it may not fit every application, but it'll work for what you need it to do. Um, or you can go to a premier tool store that has the exact tool that will do exactly what you want it to do and much more efficiently. Um, it may be harder to access. It may be harder to acquire. Um, you may have to go through a vendor to get to it, whereas the, the tool at the the, uh, the local store, uh, it's easier to get a hold of. It may not do exactly what you want, but you can you can massage it to, to work. Again, I hope that reference helps as well. Okay. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, so I think we might wrap up. Sorry, I've been really busy today, so I'm quite keen to <laughs> disappear. Um, right, uh, so next week is chapter five, which is the, kind of the first chapter where we talk about HTML widgets and its actual, you know, the functions within it and what it can set up for you. Um, we do need an, a, a, a presenter for next week, if, if anyone's keen to do that. It, it's... Um, I mean, it's a longer chapter than this week, but it has a little bit more substance, I think. Um, uh, and then the following week, it, it's like building a more realistic widget. So, so next week, it's kind of you're building a, a relatively simple tool. The following week, we're building something a little bit bigger. Um, and, you know, it's good to build up in little steps um but yeah if 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 any of you would like to present on either of those weeks there's a sign up available um on the slack channel um yes for anyone watching on on youtube thanks for joining us um you are welcome to come and join us in the book club live uh you have to sign up at the r for data science slack channel and etc um, and we have a JavaScript for R channel, uh, book club channel within there, if that's um, something you'd like to do. Anyway, thanks everyone for coming along. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you. Thanks, Russ. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thanks, everyone.